If I saw this question on a test, I have a feeling I would have gotten it wrong. Well, let's see. Let's let's walk, let's walk through it. The alpaca was domesticated by indigenous peoples in the Andes about 7,000 years ago, but which wild species did it descend from, the vicuña or Wanaco? A research team led by this person may have solved the mystery, concluding that the alpaca is the domesticated form of the vicuña, but that the modern alpaca gets only 64% of its genetic material from its wild ancestors. So uh, they have a conclusion, right? Alpaca is vicuña, but only 64%. So that but... Anytime I see a but, it's important. I pay attention to that. To me, that's a good signal that they're like, yes, the answer is that it's from the Vicuña, but the most important thing from this passage is that it's only partly from that and there's more to the story. Uh, continuing, the, le- the rest comes from the domesticated llama. The llama, meanwhile, gets 95.5% of its genetic material from its own wild ancestor, the Wanako, and the rest from the alpaca. The llama and alpaca apparently interbred widely for only a handful of generations between 400 and 600 years ago. Assuming that the findings of fans' team are valid, it can be inferred that. So if we're answering the alpaca question, the one that's literally a question at the beginning of this, the alpaca is going to be mostly vicuña, right? But then some llama. And so the llama, though, is the guanaco, right? So it's kind of a, a different thing in disguise. So it's mostly the vicuña, but that llama piece is important. So that's kind of what I would say is that there's got to be some mixing of this in some way. Let's look at let's look at the choices. Um, a, uh, modern llama populations have a greater degree of genetic diversity on average than modern alpaca populations do. Um, I I don't care about the genetic diversity. Um, it also doesn't seem that way, right? Because the llama is ninety five point five percent from the Wanako, whereas the alpaca is a mixture of things. So this just seems like a comparison that I don't care about. And then it's also just wrong. So there you go. B, the domestication process of the alpaca may have involved some introduction of genetic material from the llama. Well, that seems like my dumb summary, right? So yeah, there's a llama in the alpaca. Seems good. C, the period of interbreeding resulted in a greater genetic difference between alpacas and their wild ancestors than between llamas and their wild ancestors. Well, again, this is like a comparison of something that I don't really care about. Um... The period of interbreeding results in greater genetic difference between alpacas and their wild ancestors than between llamas and their wild ancestors. Maybe I don't eliminate it because it is kind of in here, focusing on that, that like where are these things from? And they're given numbers for both, right? I mean, normally quantifiers are things that I get nervous about, but this whole passage is quantifying things. So I don't know. I, I still don't like it, but I like B better. D, if they were subjected to genetic testing, modern populations of Wanakos and Vicuñas would likely show traces of ancient interbreeding as well. I don't care about them. This is mostly a main character issue. Uh, it's about alpacas, maybe llamas, but the other guys are just like there for the ride. They're not really important to the main story. They are – I don't care about their history. Uh, the whole thing is about the alpaca. So this is where I'd probably pick B and move on. And that's wrong. The answer is C. And so I might have, I might have gotten lucky on a real test. You know, it's hard to imagine what I would have done, right? Because I'm just seeing this question in isolation. But it's possible I would have marked it for review and gone back and noticed something and changed my answer. But I doubt it. I think I really like B because of how simple it is. It's very dumb. It matches my dumb summary very well. The domestication process of the alpaca may have involved some introduction of genetic material from the llama. Yeah, it's part llama, right? Like that seems right. The problem with this choice is the domestication process itself is not really what we're talking about here because, I, you know, I just don't really notice this. I don't pay attention to it. But they're interbreeding the llama and the alpaca 400 and 600 years ago. However, it says early on, and I would have just kind of ignored this, the alpaca was domesticated by indigenous peoples in the Andes about 7,000 years ago. So the domestication process is happening 7,000 years ago. But the interbreeding, the the reason alpacas have all this llama in them is happening four to, you know, 600 years ago. Uh, so that's different. Um, so, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's a real reason. I'm not saying that's nonsense. I'm just saying that that's something I wouldn't have paid attention to mostly because I just didn't think it mattered. You know, uh, C is still true. And this is why maybe I would have bookmarked it and come back because, you know, maybe I would have been like, well, you know, can I, should I, is, can I have a better reason for getting rid of this choice? I don't, I'm, I don't know. I still think I would have rushed it. I think I would have been like, nope, B is definitely at C is just messy for no reason. Let's get rid of it. Cause I still don't like the choice. 
The period of interbreeding resulted in a greater genetic difference between alpacas and their wild ancestors than between llamas and their wild ancestors, right? Because the alpaca is only 64% of its wild ancestor, where the llama is 95%. So a greater genetic difference, right? Even though 95 is the greater number, right? That 95 is percent that it's similar to what it came from. So the lower number here is actually the one with more difference, more diversity. So that's true. And I think, you know, this might be an example where if I did get it wrong, it would be because I'm not really following my own advice. Uh, the most important word in any passage is but, right? There's a but right there. I focused on it. And then what happened? The passage took a turn. The whole passage started to become about these numbers. It became a comparison between the two numbers, uh, between the two uh, animals, right? It was a comparison now between the genetics of the alpaca and the llama. So it makes sense that choice C is also kind of a comparison between those two things. I don't know. I just felt like B was really simple and stupid, and I just didn't think that the years would matter. That's kind of sneaky. Um, it doesn't bother me too much. My strategy works really, really well in most cases. And it's very, very rare that following the patterns that I do and looking at the words that I do and using the trap answer choices and strong words and all those things, rarely does my following that path lead to a wrong answer. So the occasional thing might slip through, but eh, whatever, it happens. I'm fine with a 790 instead of an 800. It's okay. And I think that that's important is some people you know, try out the, the strategies and they don't like them because they find the one or two cases where it doesn't work. And then they're like, ah, well, this strategy doesn't work. But think of all the times it does work. And, and that's the key is you want to find something that works 80, 90% of the time. Nothing's going to work 100% of the time. Not how the SAT works. So this does not bother me. Uh, oh, well, it would bother me a little bit. Who am I kidding? But it doesn't bother me in the sense of like changing my strategy and making me think, oh my God, I really should have spent more time on this one. Eh, it was it was fine. If it was a test and it slipped through, no big deal. Um, but I really just, you know, from my experience, didn't think that the years would matter. But if I am, again, following my own kind of advice, I, the trap answers that I'm worried about in the choices, things like quantifiers, comparisons, they also tend to show up in the in the passage occasionally. And when they show up in the passage, that's usually what the passage is about. So this passage is quantifying. This passage is comparing. This passage is also discussing the concept of time. And that's another one of those trap answers that I usually eliminate uh, because I just they they're introducing a, a comparison of time that just doesn't really matter in the passage. But here it did matter. Here the passage is talking about seven thousand versus four hundred to six hundred. They're far apart, so I didn't I didn't quite catch it. But it is there, and then it makes sense that that same difference in time would matter in some way in the answer choices. It really doesn't matter for C, but it does help me eliminate B. And so what? You know, I missed something. It happens. What about you? Did you guys think B might have been an answer when you first looked at it?